one. Hey, uh, you know how to trigger a room full of hackers? Cyber. <laughs> ah, there we go. <laughs> I don't know if you guys know, but I'm actually trans robot, and cyber's a trigger word for me, so. <laughs> um, welcome to the presentation here for the Pwn Drone, um, the modern airborne cyber threat. You know, who am I? My name's Devin Gergen. I am a senior consultant for a company called CrowdStrike. I do incident response, digital forensics. Mostly I do penetration tests and I exist on the offensive side because that's primarily where my background is. Uh, I spent eight years in the Air Force doing operational security uh, as well as active cyber operations. You know, that's the Air Force term, don't kill me, um, for actual real world attacks and, uh, and defenses. So. Uh, I, I also authored a, a memory parsing script called VShot that utilizes the volatility framework and multi-threads it. Uh, check it out, it'll reduce your volatility time by uh, like at least two-thirds, I guarantee it. And I'm an ultimate frisbee wizard, so if you fall asleep during this talk, I will throw things at you. Cert soup for those of you who care about it. So uh, today we'll go over the idea where, where this kind of came from. A um, little bit of controversy around drones. I'll talk about the background with the military type tech. Uh, we'll discuss drones in the actual kill chain and uh, continue on with a uh, little bit more details on the actual attacks from drones. So the idea was to be able to take commercialized materials uh, that are readily available to the public slap them together with duct tape and somehow end up with a predator. Uh, you know, it, it really stems from just, I, I, I went and gave a presentation on security at B-Size Oklahoma, and I really wanted to, for my next talk, just do something cool. And I was like, well, you know what? Drones are cool. Let's, let's see what fun we can uh, figure out with them. So there's a lot of controversy surrounding drones nowadays, um, especially concerning privacy. You've got... Uh, you know, these laws with regards to wiretapping, surveillance reconnaissance, you know, everything that, that a drone does as far as capturing audio, capturing video, uh, really we have laws in place that already cover that, but because it's a drone, people think it's spooky. You know, we, we, we have surveillance laws. If you're in a public space, expect that if somebody takes a picture of you that it's still going to be legal on their end. Um, as you see here in this uh, screenshot from YouTube, there's this crazed woman who thought this boy was just being a peeping Tom on the beach flying his drone around, you know, taking pictures of women. But this is the kind of outrage that, you know, pr the privacy issue can really trigger on people. Uh, some other issues are airspace, especially with regards to drones uh, flying too high or too low. Um, you know, it, it, the FAA fortunately for us, or unfortunately, does actually have control from the ground up. So FAA authority, you know? <laughs> um, it's actually a myth that anything 400 feet below, the FAA has no, no clearance or um, no way in on, um, which actually comes from the, 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 uh, an old standard where commercial flights had to be at least 500 feet in the air. So that's kind of the background of where this myth came from, of a 400 foot, you know, I can do whatever I want zone. Yeah. Uh, in addition to that, we have no-fly zones. You've got people who have tried to use drones around airports. Um, you have the, the White House incident that happened. Real quick, is, can anybody name the type of drone that, that flew over the fence to the White House? DJI Phantom. DJI Phantom. You get a t-shirt. And, and a sticker. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we've got the, the thing that happened with the White House, uh, Camp David, Groom Lake, Area 51, you know, I dare somebody to try and fly a drone over Area 51 and see how far they get. Um, you know, pull. Yeah, yeah, pull. <laughs> so one, one of the interesting things about the White House is that the White House isn't actually a no-fly zone physically. I put it on here uh, in particular to note that DJI Phantom is actually implementing in their firmware for their drone technology a no-fly zone in Washington, D.C., so uh, I think it's like 15 miles in, in circumference of the White House. They, they've programmed their new updated firmware to uh, not fly. So, you know, what that means to the commercial off-the-shelf guys, they can't fly it there. What that means to a hacker or somebody like us, 
Uh, you know, not much because we can just patch over that functionality. Challenge accepted. Uh, another big controversy around drones is its modern use in warfare. Uh, we've all seen the news recently. We've all seen the, the controversy around President Obama and the drone strikes. Um, but really what, what the warfare portion of drones have done have just made drones and made our actions militarily cheaper in the long run, which means we can do more of them at a more cost efficient, in a more cost efficient manner. Um, in the end, the type of warfare that's being conducted with drones it would have happened either way, but the only difference is now instead of having an F-18 Hornet launching from a um, aircraft carrier, we have a drone launching for, you know, air base and air base in, in Qatar. So a lot, lot of, you know, tension around that subject. So with uh, military drone tech uh, actually started in the 19, late 1950s when the United States Air Force actually started being concerned for the lives of its pilots. Um, you know, being hit with a missile in an aircraft is not a pleasant thing, you know, especially when it, 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 you have so many things that can go wrong. You can damage the ejection systems, you can actually kill the pilot upon impact. It's not like a Top Gun movie or, or Iron Eagle where, oh crap, they hit my wing, eject, eject. You know, we're actually losing guys. So they came up uh, actually during Vietnam um, and had three primary, dr primary drones that they came up with, and these are actually large, full-sized, automated UAVs, right? Uh, I don't know if you can see here with the, the picture of the Global Hawk, but uh, that's actually, you know, we've got people standing next to the Glo Global Hawk. This was the size of like a full F-4 type aircraft that had an, an ISR component to it. And when, you know, China and Russia had shot down some of our stuff in Vietnam, uh, you know, the U.S.'s response to that was no comment. Uh, it, mod, with modern technology, we think of the Global Hawk, uh, which is really popular in the early and late 90s. We've got the Predator drones, which everybody knows from being able to do ISR, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, as well as the Reaper drone, which drops the missiles. Um, we've also got the RQ-170 Sentinel, which hit, uh, everybody was, was very interested um, when Iran said that they had taken it down uh, via a cyber hack, right? Um, so that was that, that's an interesting point with regards to drones and the type of technology to be used. Uh, and then we also have the experimental uh, X-34B space-based uh, UAV that had actually just landed, I think, a couple months ago after spending 22 consecutive months orbiting the Earth. So, you know, we're, we've been, from the U.S. standpoint, in the game for a long time. Other countries that have uh, drone programs, you know, include Russia, China, Israel is, you know, despite one of our, quote, allies, you know, they, they still have their own separate drone program. And then, of course, if Iran, and for fuck's sake, if North Korea has a drone program, we should be able to buy that shit off the, off, you know, Walmart, right? <laughs> so, commercialized drones, right? Uh, Highly available. You've got the GGI Phantom like we discussed earlier, um, and the capabilities just keep evolving, evolving. Availability keeps on growing. You've got these little hobby shops that are spawning up. You've got little components here and there that affect the weight of a drone, or the way you fly it, and the software keeps improving too. You know, I, it, just looking through uh, uh, Google and a couple other catalogs, you've seen your $20 toys where you've got a, a small little controller and you can fly it around with Bluetooth all the way up to like the $8,500, hey, I'm going to send it on a, a journey around the earth type drone. Um, not necessarily that they have the range for that, but they, they, some people have uh, big aspirations. You know, some of the typical capabilities, we are talking about the RF spectrum here uh, when we're talking about drones. Uh, within like the U.S. military type technology, we are actually uh, launching our drones from, say, an air base in, uh, in Kuwait, right? And that's actually being launched from Kuwait, but the signal for taking off being in Kuwait uh, then gets transferred via satellite all the way down to Creech Air Force Base in Nevada. And we've got Air Force operators actually flying those via satellite globally around the world. So even though, you know, really the range can be unlimited depending upon your technology and what you have available, Oh. I just need to make a quick announcement.
But okay. If anybody has a black van that they park in the back behind the menu, you have to move it because the taco truck cannot pull in and we will have no tacos. They have to be in the back. Move your van. Move your van right now. I need to move it now. <laughs> I want tacos, so somebody better go move their van. <laughs> we can we can with that van. We we will break this. <laughs> All right. Um, so we've got the typical 2.5 to 5 gigahertz uh, range. Uh, what this means in conventional terms is about you know uh, 70 to 100 feet, depending upon conditions. Uh, with your typical, say, from you know an, an, an Android device to actual drone. Um, this can actually be easily extended with an off-the-shelf router uh, by mapping the router name, your ESSID, uh, and using the router as a hot point in between your router and the drone, um, and actually attaching a much more powerful antenna to the, to the router uh, versus your, your Android or uh, whatever other controlling device you have. Additionally, you can cut out uh, the, the 802.11 spectrum completely. You're still going to be hanging out in the 2.4 gigahertz RF spectrum. Um, uh, you're, you've still got plenty of space, but the benefit of that is that you will effectively not have to deal with all the overhead of TCP IP. You'll have your command and control, your protocol all happening just pure over R the RF spectrum, uh, which actually is really great for individuals who are looking to make high performance drones. Uh, there was just a, a race that just happened. Um, in Australia, where uh, they had at least uh, 30 drones inside a building that had to make it at least six laps around and do like these little weave things. Uh, all of those drones were RF based instead of having the overhead of TCP IP. Um, so, it, from a speed standpoint, off the shelf, you know, it, it, it just depends on what drone you're using, depends on your motor, depends on, on the aerodynamics of the device, and of course your weather conditions, right? So uh, in, in this case, we're going to talk about it a little bit later. Uh, being able to get in and out quickly uh, might be uh, a key for your specific objective. Uh, but you know, either way, if you're flying you know, 11 miles an hour over a building and dropping something off, well, I think that 11 miles an hour is going to work, and you're going to be able to save money in the long run when you're creating your attack platform. So, uh, commercial use. We've got a, a lot of legitimate business uses that, that we're starting to see come into the light uh, with regards to using drones, such as farming, being able to have your drone go out and look at your crops and observe. You know, essentially, we're using the military application for video, uh, for pictures, to be able to keep track of crops, um, cattle, the whole nine yards. You know, while some people still like to use horses, you know, you're, you're, you're going to see a bump in, in technology coming up and people actually being able to use drones and send drones out to do things, you know, in, like say in, in Alaska, uh, trying to scout for, for moose or something like that, uh, your negative degree weather, instead of sending people out to go do that and brave the weather, you can send out your drone, uh, high flying up in the air, um, and be able to use that instead. And of course, you know, there's the, the ever popular Pizza Hut and Amazon delivery drones, which I find is hilarious. You know, they, it's great that they've come up with this wonderful concept. Um, I, I feel like the, the weight distribution of your typical Amazon package, where I've got, you know, either a tiny micro USB with a gigantic box or a tiny box with a gigantic battery in it is just completely variable on their end. So they're going to have to figure out something in order to make that accurately work. So, drones in the kill chain. Uh, real quick show of hands. Who knows about the kill chain? Okay, we got a couple people. Uh, the kill chain is based off of a uh, Lockheed Martin security researcher's uh, word. It's trademarked as the cyber kill chain. Uh, <laughs> triggered. <laughs> um, the, uh, it's basically a seven step process that every attack is going to have associated with it. You know, starting with reconnaissance. Uh, from your recon data, you create, you, you, you weaponize something. So say, uh, if you're doing it from a pen test standpoint, you, you pull a document off of a website and you're able to determine that this PDF was created from Microsoft Word 2003, but it was made like two days ago. 
they're probably using some outdated software. I can create my, my uh, I can weaponize a, a, a document from that standpoint. Um, delivery goes down to exploitation, installation, command and control, and then you go on to your actual objectives of like, you know, pilfering customer data, that kind of thing. So where do drones fit? Uh, from this standpoint, you've got reconnaissance, which we've kind of talked about already with, you know, being able to take pictures, being able to take video, um, and then also Wi-Fi. You know, we can actually equip these drones with something simple, and we'll talk about payloads later, uh, as a Raspberry Pi that's just designed to go and sniff Wi-Fi data. Um, and then, of course, I, you know, this is just my personal opinion. I think it also uh, fits into delivery as we've seen from Amazon, as we've seen from Domino's, uh, but we can also use it as a delivery for our attack platform or our payloads. You know, it really, you know, all this is, let me show you my busted ass drone here, um, which actually I'm missing a landing gear here. Um, all this is, you know, is a platform. You can put anything on this. Uh, what you're really limited by is the weight uh, and the power as well as, uh, and the power of your motors as well as the available power that you have for a fuel source. So, semi-automated flight. Uh, it, it's really become trivial to be able to take a commercialized drone and send it off uh, to perform a certain task uh, because we have onboard computers that we can just throw instructions onto and, and send the, our drones off on its merry way. Uh, this, this specifically, this is a device for the AR Drone 2.0, which I have up here. I haven't bought that device yet, but I'm excited to play with it when I do. Uh, you basically, you plug it in via USB, and you're able to program your flight path as well as your, the height of your flight path within that actual GPS navigation piece. What this does is it allows you as an attacker to, A, you know, include this, and, and send your drone off its merry way to do it whatever ISR you want, to deliver whatever package you want, uh, and then it, you know it allows it to come back to you at, at the end with full video capture, full audio capture, completely autonomous away from you. Once it's gone, it goes out, does its thing, and comes back. You know, uh, there are, however, risks that come with this. You know. Uh, Threats to drones, you know, you've got objects. It's the exact same type of threats that you face from your commercialized aircraft. You've got bird strikes. Um, there's, there's a wonderful YouTube video where you, a guy is out flying his, his phantom drone, um, and he had a hawk come in and completely just take it out. <laughs> I guess the, the hawk felt a little threatened, like it was uh, invading its airspace. Um, power lines, trees, the, the, the normal objects. You know, not necessarily that, that a plane would really have to worry about because you'd be flying higher in a plane, but trees, especially when you're trying to do some sort of pre precision type navigation, um, power lines around your target areas as an attacker are, are all threats. And of course, people. Um, this guy actually did a pretty good hoax um, that looked like a good hoax until uh, it showed, uh, it switched camera view. So it showed him going out, uh, coming out, and this guy's coming out, he's going to shoot down this drone, but then it shows his buddy behind him filming him. So, uh, a <laughs> little, little unrealistic, uh, you know, attempts there. But, you know, if, if people feel that their privacy or their airspace is being violated, especially in certain areas of the country, you know, I, I don't, wouldn't surprise if, if we hear more about laws or issues of, of uh, trespassing and a person defending their rights by shooting down a drone. You know? We're looking at Amazon here. <laughs> so, so uh, other threats, uh, electronic-based threats, um, flight takeovers. Uh, you know, as many of you know, we saw the whole spiel about Iran saying, "Oh, we we hacked the uh, your your stealth drone and we made it land," which you know, uh, for, as we all know from a technical standpoint, is not impossible. Uh, but what ended up happening um, is, I think the official word was that some of the damage on the video that they released made it look like it actually fell into a flat spin and, and crashed just perfect to, to maintain its, its integrity. Um, what they've tried to do since then 
many believe is the video footage that they've released is create a mock-up of their own and show it taking off and landing and, oh, we've hacked your drone kind of thing. So very, very chest-beating, um, uh, you know, version of, of publicity that they're trying to get from it. Uh, that being said, uh, a couple years ago, I think it was 2013, a uh, security researcher, um, I'll get you guys the name here later, uh, created a Skyjack drone um, that he used. It's just a simple AR drone. I think he was using the AR drone 1.0 at the time, um, and a Raspberry Pi device. Uh, it's, and since the AR drones don't use any encryption on their Wi-Fi, their 802 ad hoc networks, um, he created you know a simple batch script that once detected the AR drone network, deauthenticated whoever was connected to it, and ended up taking over that drone and flying it to a localized point. So it's a pretty great video the guy has on on his website. Um, because it reminded me of, of playing with the drone in my basement because it went off somewhere else and then crashed into him. And uh, I, I can't count the number of bruises I've had from that damn drone <laughs> while, while, while working on this project. Signal jamming, um, it, it's, it's legal, but it's still possible. If you throw a 2.4 gigahertz frequency signal at a receiving device with just garbage data at a much powerful level, then the origin of that device, that device is going to lose connection. It's not going to be able to interpret that wireless data. Um, and there's, at that point, not much, uh, you know, CSMCA can do about it. Uh, you know, that being said, you've also got GPS signal manipulation, which uh, what many people, many security researchers theorize that is how Iran had gotten um, the, the, the stealth drone to actually drop was by manipulating the GPS signal on the drone itself uh, to, to make the drone think that it was somewhere when it wasn't somewhere else to make it land. Uh, you know, I, I will say this with my military experience, uh, the, the level of technology, the level of encryption used, that, that event is highly unlikely. Um, you know, you've got different things, you've got different encryption, keys, algorithms, uh, frequency and signal hopping, all sorts of defensive measures that, that our technology uses and that can be in use uh, even, even in commercial piloting of aircraft, but not necessarily uh, have, has this technology made into drones. Question? That, that's the whole work that's turned on. If somebody puts it in test mode, it leaves the encryption off. Right. Right, exactly. So if somebody puts it in test mode, or if you um, set up your device to uh, do a GPS navigated flight, right, uh, you can set your device up to uh, you can set your device up to launch, where you launch it with your, your uh, Android or iPhone-based device, um, and then once it makes it outside of your range, it'll kill that signal. Good point. So um, I read another article on GPS signal manipulation where uh, a security research group was actually able to send the signal of 10 GPS satellites to a boat. Uh, and made this crew go off course. Of course, you know, the, the crew was in on it, so they knew that they thought that they were on course and were doing the right thing, but it's pretty interesting that we look at, at using electronic signals um, and GPS and how much we rely on it. Um, I, I'm interested to see what an experienced sea captain would have done in that situation had they, they have done it at night and been comparing, say, the GPS data to the stars and their location. You know, the, the, the old, kind of the old school way of doing it. Payloads and attacks. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there are many options that we really have here from uh, drone delivery. You know, these are commercialized tools that are available. The Android-based Pony Express uh, Pone Phone is, is just one that comes to mind. That's what I uh, <laughs> had attempted to turn this one into, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, you do a custom build uh, on, on your phones. You can use a Raspberry Pi uh, or the Q-Droid. Now, I will say this. One thing to take in mind, uh, keep in mind when you're talking about your payload, uh, is while this is great, it has a lot of capability, think about going out. This thing cost me 30 bucks at Walmart. So I'm able to customize it. I can root my Android phone. But even though it has a battery, it has 3 or 4G antenna built into it, it has GPS built into it, you know, someone would say, hey, that's a great payload. You've still got the weight of the screen. You've still got the weight of the case. Uh, but there's nothing stopping you from gutting it down. Um, and then, of course, I'm excited to see about 
uh, the the modified HDMI sticks. Uh, you know, a lot of fun, interesting things coming up where you've got the HDMI p PCs all in one PC, where all you have to do is plug the HDMI stick into your monitor or TV or whatever. Uh, Intel just released one. Uh, a couple other companies are, are demoing them. Uh, you know, a great way to bring your your computer with you. Well, you know, g given the the nature of HDMI and the kind of plugs. Uh, there's going to have to do, be some hardware hacking to get things to work properly. You're also going to have to include something maybe like a 3G card in, built into it um, or some sort of uh, mix and match, excuse me, or some sort of mix and match uh, type of technology where you use like the HDMI, HDMI stick or use uh, the Raspberry Pi and say a mobile hotspot that you've gutted down to its bare components for weight and you've got the connectivity of the mobile hotspot You've got the Raspberry Pi hooked up. You've got it hooked back into you via VPN, um, and maybe a, a, a solar panel that you bought off of Amazon. So, uh, as far as launching these payloads goes, uh, it, it's really rather easy, depending upon the type of drone that you're using. You know, can you imagine being able to set up uh, your own device network where you've got, say, you know, a Raspberry Pi or an Android phone? Uh, cell phone with a solar panel on the back, and you say want to fly that around. Um, a, you've got different types of targets, but you've also got the opportunity to maybe make a botnet, throw it on top of a Starbucks, throw five or six of them on top of a Starbucks, and start you know conducting cyber operations from Starbucks or Starbucks or McDonald's all over 3G slash 4G, um, and then you've got the solar panel recharging it. So, another quick question: uh, Can anybody name the uh, the um, uh, what the heck is it? The space, the space uh, probe that just recently came back to life. You already got one. Ah, it's it's the I believe it's pronounced fly or fly or whatever. But you know, good good effort for guessing. You get my last T-shirt. Oh. Sorry, I'm a little bit more accurate normally. This has got these bright lights in my eyes. <laughs> um, so being able to, to take your payload, uh, attach a solar panel to it, you may be able to also include some logic into it um, where it's got some, some sort of low power component that's set up to turn off when it's low on power and turn back on and become available, beacon out to your infrastructure via 3G, 4G, um, you know, over the, the SS7 network. Uh, when it comes back on, when it has enough power to come back on and be of use to you. So uh, it, it's, it's pretty interesting. You know, we can also think about this in terms of a corporate site being able to drop a, a you know, maybe, maybe you don't want to, um, you know, maybe you want to use a, a uh, you know, a, a Atheros-based Wi-Fi card, uh, gut it down, put it on there, um, and you want to sit down there and you want to sniff Wi-Fi information. You want to Get as much as possible, you know, uh, of the. You maybe get the WPA key exchange, do some deauth attacks, um, and then you're able to take that data and instead of trying to run it and crack it on the device itself, which is going to waste battery power, you're going to transfer that data via 3G, 4G to your back end, to your Amazon infrastructure, um, to your Vulture, you know, servers, and, and, and just run, crunch the data there. So, um, you know, some, some issues with the payloads. We uh, talked about uh, the weight of the battery, the screen, and, and really what you need to do uh, as much as possible is strip it down. But it also depends upon what your payload is. You know, if, if your drone, if your delivery device can handle the weight of that payload and you don't need to modify it, you know, why go through the trouble? And then again, we talk about longevity, uh, adding the solar panel, but you also, by adding a solar panel, add weight. Uh, uh, so, so these are things to think about when you're kind of creating your different payloads for delivery via drone. You know, as, as we talked about uh, with, with different attacks, we've got you know uh, wireless. We got the 802 spe spectrum. We've got Kismet, Aircrack NG, um, and actually this phone is running. Um, you know, it's Android, but it's got a rooted environment with Kali on it. Um, and inside of Cali is, of course, we've got uh, Kismet, an Aircrack NG suite. Um, the issue specifically with this drone, uh, and I actually had, had it working for a little bit with this until I f f bricked it for a little bit, um, had to reformat it, 
um, what is uh, the type of drivers that you use. You've still got to have support for your wireless hardware to match with your uh, mobile hardware. Um, this is an LG Optimus. I wouldn't necessarily recommend this if you're trying to make a payload for actual packet injection or, or packet um, sniffing. Uh, but it certainly allows you, from a 3G, 4G standpoint, with a VPN to be able to connect to another network and do your C2, your command control over that uh, 3G, 4G network into your target data, your target network. So if you've already done your recon, uh, you've got the password. It might work out for you. It's a cheaper solution. Um, is, yeah, that's the thing is, is when you're talking about working with a you know, your, your own type of wireless cards or gutting them down, you do have to have that driver uh, availability or you have to work on coding your own driver and integrating that within the ROM of the device that you're going to be connecting it to. And you can easily, like, uh, with this, this is, you know, a normal USB device. You've got these, o I think they're OTR cables. Um, just plug them in, plug them into your, your device. Some of the modern, you know, Androids with KitKat um, and above will recognize these devices immediately. Some of them do not. Uh, it's, it's really a crapshoot on, and this is the drawback of Android, right, is the device manufacturer and what that device manufacturer really wants to include support for on their device. Um, this device was a big pain in the ass. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that, that uh, of this LG phone is that the manufacturer, um, SmartTalk, did not include a boot iOS or, or a boot ROM on this. So there's some further hacking that we can do. I fiddled with it, uh, got it to work a little bit, not as much as I would have wanted to have, but um, the uh, b basically without that having a, a device that supports boot ROM, without a device that you can root, without a device that you can upload your own ROM to support your devices, uh, you're kind of stuck with your basic level capabilities of Android. Now that being said, um, you know, we, we, we think about the 802 spectrum, we think about BGN, very popular office for offices nowadays. Uh, what we don't often think about, you know, is from the standpoint of Bluetooth or Zigbee wireless, you know. A lot of um, industrial sites are using Zigbee for small power components uh, that uh, don't really have great security built into the Zigbee protocol. So if I'm able to take my drone and drop off a Zigbee-enabled device uh, into a, you know, an industrial park or, say, a, a fertilizer plant, and I'm able to get up over the walls, fly it over, drop it down, and just wait for, uh, you know, wait for data, sniff it, analyze the protocol, break the protocol. Maybe I want to, you know, flip a switch within Zigbee, which actually also controls uh, chlorine, uh, chlorine distribution throughout a plant or something like that. Very, very dangerous stuff when you have unsecured wireless protocols that people, you know, and security experts, they're like, oh, hey, you know, it's it, it's insecure here, but you know what? It's just so short range, nobody can reach it. Um, additionally, you've got the, you know, attacks, like the deauth attacks. Uh, there's actually a wonderful bash script. Just look up Google deauth bomb. Um, pretty like, uh, and it's pretty straightforward. All it does is sit in, a, you know, and works with your wireless card to detect new networks. You can do like free frequency hopping. Um, I think by the, the original script is just set to do it on one network, but you can easily modify that to switch channels, switch ESSIDs, detect whatever you can and continue to signal hop and de-auth as much as possible uh, while it's going through there. Now, you know, who, who has, who's heard of Scapy? Python framework. A couple people. Uh, there's a py great Python framework called Scapy uh, that's wonderful for crafting TCP and IP uh, type data and packets. Uh, what you can actually do is put your wireless card in promiscuous mode and just sit there and let raw data come into it and throw up a Python script that's going to detect that raw data. And when it starts seeing authentication, when it starts seeing Wi-Fi, you can pull that data out and actually just throw out raw signal data that's going to de-authenticate uh, much faster than just a bash script. And then, you know, as we talked uh, earlier, uh, even though signal jamming is possible, it's hard to do, especially even from a wireless standpoint, 
Um, you now, when we talked about signal jamming earlier, uh, we, we discussed how you needed to have a more powerful signal than the source that you were trying to jam. Um, you know, that being said, when you have those kind of situations, the wireless platform and the amount of power that you need to put into overriding that wireless signal uh, really depends on A, the location of where your attack's coming from, and B, how long you can keep that up given your mobile platform. You, we do have limits here with, with our battery life. Um, maybe it might be a little different with a little RC engine, but you know, then you've got the offset of that being super loud while it's happening. Um, as we talked earlier at the attack issues, you gotta have the proper software, uh, gotta have the proper support. Um, a good rule of thumb, especially when you're working with Android devices, is if it's on SciGenMod.org, you can likely get it to work with a wireless device that you'd use then to uh, attack your target. So, uh, some some resources here, you know, uh, as far as putting Linux on your phone, really, uh, this, this was super easy, very low tech. A lot of people have already done this stuff for you. Uh, you know, download Linux Deploy for Android. Uh, we said Sajim on here. Use your Android built-in VPN connection connected to a PPTP type network. That will connect over your 3G, 4G. You're able to use SSH to log into your Android. You're able to launch something like Kali Linux um, within a Cheruta device or Cheruta environment. Uh, and really sorry about this. I couldn't get the uh, the proper uh, uh, the, the 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 VNC session to work properly here, but. Uh, Real quick, that is it launching, that's, that's this device launching Kali right now. Um, it runs SSH, it runs VNC, I can connect this via 3G, 4G, uh, operate it through my VPN. I can connect this to a target network, uh, and I can use Metasploit straight off of the, this device here. And you know, what's great about this is it's already got its battery built in. I don't have to rely on a drone battery in order for, uh, in order for power, to power this device. And I can leave it. You know, so in conclusion, the uh, portion of the CISSP that deals with wall heights is now completely irrelevant. Uh, you know, and, and really what it gets down to, and I know it looks like we're going to end a little bit early here, and that's good because I want to have open discussion, but, uh, you know, I, I want to hear your ideas. I want to hear your creative thoughts. Uh, you know, the sky is literally the limit with drones. <laughs> I know, bad joke, sorry. Um, and then, uh, you know, it, like, like uh, the, uh, in the opening uh, keynote, you know, there is no silver bullet. Attacks are becoming more and more complex. You have to use multiple technologies to make your attacks more effective because you, you do have companies, you do have organizations using their defense in depth. You've got them patching every patch Tuesday on, you know, on the dot every Tuesday. Uh, so you really have to kind of be creative and work around different technologies and use different technologies to include or to accomplish your goal. So um, well, I think of it like launching a Java-based applet uh, and getting a user to click yes. You've always, you've already used Java. You've got your payload. Maybe it's an interpreter. Maybe you've got a core. You have some money. You can use Core Impact, uh, some sort of rat. Um, just wrote a PowerShell for my last pen test. PowerShell uh, backdoor. Uh, and, and you're using different technologies on, at that aspect. Um, and you can mix and match, really. Um, and, and what it gets down to is attacks nowadays, especially with drones, uh, from a physical security standpoint, are easy and they are cheap. You know, this, the, the AR Drone 2.0, I'm not trying to advertise here. Uh, I should get kickbacks for this, right? Um, was 400 bucks. 400 bucks. And the adversary, oh, oh, there it goes. Adversary could use this, um, uh, go to the store with cash, pick one up at Brookstone, and you be able to use it as a delivery platform. And you know, given the budgets of some of our more prevalent adversaries in today's or in today's cyber world, cybersecurity world, you know, uh, you've got China, you've got Russia, you've got Iran with a, a full-on cyber program. Uh, you know, given their budgets that they have to do this stuff, uh, it's it's not out of the realm of possibility. You know, with that, I want to open it up for some questions and discussion. Here's my contact info. Uh, highway to the danger zone. <laughs> uh, questions?
Right. So uh, the question was, uh, is there any concern about using the 802.11 spectrum with certain types of drones? Yes, there is concern because the same type of frequencies that those drones may use for command and control but also be the same types of frequencies that your device or your, your payload is going to use. Um, so uh, you, you have, you know, uh, this is, uh, I think this runs on 802.11n um, by default. And, you know, so maybe you want to switch it. Maybe you want to, you know, go outside the realm of, okay, well, I know my, my target base is going to use 802.11n. Uh, maybe I want to switch to an Aerodrome 1.0 and use a really powerful directional antenna um, in, in order to avoid interference with that, my device, my attack platform. So just, just real quick, I want to show you how easy this is. And while that's happening, um, other questions? Yes, actually, there's a lot. There's a lot of research uh, on the uh, you know open internet where people have done um, different connections. They've added. They've done different types of hacks, and a lot of the hacks that they do are are based around being able to, as a hobbyist make the drone fly longer in, in the air. So they'll add like a, a long antenna or a deployable antenna. Um, so certainly the, the capabilities there uh, exist. So once we're connected here. You know, I actually had, had a really cool demo uh, that I was gonna do. <laughs> Unfortunately, I forgot my, my, uh, my joystick here, but uh, Fun, fun fact, the German military, for their control of the air drones, uses a Logitech 3D Pro. So uh, it's, it's, I, I've got one at home. I love it. It's a lot of fun. Let's get this going here. Oh, oh, oh. Coming down. Ah. Live demos, right? And this is what I was talking about earlier with bruising the crap out of my fingers. If you're going to play with this stuff, don't be afraid to get hurt. You know, I've got a 1.0 of these things. Um, it's a, uh, there we go, there we go. Come on up. Maybe. Run away, run away. Real quick, while while I'm doing this, any other questions? You know, I've got I've got a bunch of swag I can give out to you guys. Sure. <laughs> yes. So there's a wonderful um, paper on that called Skynet, which actually was yeah, go figure. Uh, uh, was actually a, a huge inspiration for this talk. I had read it back in 2011, and they have a, a great. Uh, I believe they were using the AR drone 1.0 at the time, and they were using uh, 3G to as well as the GPS device over 3G uh, to fly their drone around. Um, you know, everything that I said, and I want to give uh, full credit to them, is, is nothing new. Uh, th these, these theories, this, this, um, uh, about this platform has been around for years. Uh, you know, my, my goal with this talk today was just to open up the discussion and, and make sure that, you know, bring, bring it to light within, you know, the modern day, uh, taking a modern day look at it and how easy it really is to do these days. Come on. There we go. Oh. God damn it. Anyways. So I, I actually racked the crap out of this last night, so my, I'm probably experiencing some balance issues. What I wanted to show is that this off-the-shelf Walmart phone, it, it can sit here, and <laughs> it really does sit on here very well. Um, and in order to deliver it, you know, all it takes is a crash landing. Um, with my earlier demo, I had it programmed to do a flip, and I was going to make a joke about it being a flip phone. <laughs> but uh, it, it's, it's really easy to do. I mean, you don't even need to use an, a, a phone for your attack platform. Throw a USB stick on here. Throw a USB stick it right in here, and have this thing do a flip that throws it to the ground, um, you know, in the parking lot somewhere that, of a walled-off building. Um, you know, somebody's going to pick up th that, that USB stick. Someone's going to plug it in. Um, you know, maybe you want to get crazy, throw a CD on here, find some sort of disc launcher or something like that. Um, 
but but that that you know the the these possibilities do exist. Come on now. Come on. Stop. Stop. <laughs> right? Ah, fuck it. I tried. Uh, well, what I'm going to do is, is, is after this talk here, I'm going to get this working, and then uh, I'll throw a video up on YouTube and show you guys it. Uh, really, it's, it's quite tri trivial to do. Um, you know, that being said, we still got 15 minutes here. I know everybody's hungry for lunch. Other questions? Concerns? Oh, yes. 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 So that's... Um, you know, the goal of this talk was to do a commercial off the shelf. Uh, really, there are a lot of mod kits out there. There's a huge, huge community of people who do this as a hobby. Uh, you know, there's videos out there uh, about these little drones these guys make up um, with powerful, powerful engines, little teeny weight, and they can get them flying, you know, 100, 200 miles an hour, um, which is actually really great, except for when they crash and they just turn into obliterated bolt. Um, I, I think I heard a question over here earlier asking if I had insurance for my drone. <laughs> I do not, um, but certainly that, that that begs, you know, right? Homeowners insurance, which you could put it under. You could you could in theory put it under. Um, now, uh, with as, as far as insurance goes, you know, if you're going to have drone insurance, you know, you got to have cyber insurance. What happens if you get hacked? Who should be responsible for that? Who should pay who? Uh, you know, uh, we've got a, our legal counsel at CrowdStrike, Steve Chabinski, is always on Capitol Hill uh, trying to, you know, say, hey, you, we, you know, we should have more protections from the consumer side to be able to understand, you know, the Chinese nation state threat, the Russian nation state threat, um, and be able to pursue legal repercussions with those entities, um, whether or not they're using drones, and, you know, that's, that's up to them. <laughs> sure. Right. What is the communication signal? What do you have to have on it? It's not a safety controller. Is it? No. So there's there's a couple of different ones. There's actually a drone um, just announced. I think I think I know what you're Yeah, the OE. What is it? DJI. The DJI. Um, so there's a different company. I know DJI does a lot of different drones. The DJI does have a following drone. There was one um, that was designed to be compact that would fold out, and you just literally throw it, and depending upon what you set it up, with this little wrist device, um, it would follow you. So, you know, it depends on the distance. Bluetooth, despite all popular belief, can go beyond 10 meters. <laughs> so it just requires more power to be able to accomplish. Uh, most of these things, especially in commercial spaces, are 802.11. Any other? Awesome. Well, thank you guys today. You know, don't, don't eat too much. We've got people uh, presenting after here who... Uh, who would like your attention so we don't need that lunchtime sleepiness. <laughs> Thank you all.